Space.nyc. I see a couple new people here today, but a lot of regulars, which is good. And um, we are a little disclaimer we're streaming the event, but all the streaming is facing this way. So, um, and yeah, so today we have Andre yeah, Andre Montanis Ferrios from the Planetary Society, and he's going to talk about the all notorious light sail spacecraft. So, without further ado, here's Andre. Yes, to start. Hello, Internet. Um, so, to start, um, there's pizza and wine in the back, so help yourself. And today we're going to be talking about the light cell spacecraft. But before that, I just want to say thank you for coming. And I'm from the Planetary Society. I'm the outreach coordinator for here for New York City. Um, and we organize all these types of events. We like news, uh, news space NYC. We look forward to democratizing and getting to uh, to people know about and participate in this type of events and uh, in space, space exploration and science literacy. Okay. Um, as part of these events, uh, we uh, we have a, a sign-up sheet in the in the front in, in the entrance. So if you sign up, uh, we do a weekly newsletter for, with all the events, space events, science events here in New York. We do not spam, I promise. We just send you a nice weekly every Sunday or Monday with information about all the events going around in New York City at least about space, science, engineering, all the STEM fields, and a little bit of art. And without further ado, I'm just going to start with our star today, which is LightSail. As you, many of you know and have seen, LightSail was a spacecraft uh, launched in May 20th uh, by, the, uh, by, uh, by the Planetary Society. And many were started at, uh, started knowing about the Planetary Society and about LightSail when it was launched. But this is not new. This is old technology, old concepts, all new science, uh, all new technology. What's new is the, the, the technology that, that we're saying, uh, using. But everything else, it's old, it has been thought of. And today I'm going to be talking about that story. That story that, that began the idea of sending a light cell 
a, a solar cell, a cell that flies with the sun's breeze. So I'm just going to begin with a little video, uh, a little introduction uh, uh, of light cells. So as you can see, light cell, it's a small spacecraft, uh, uh, an ultra set, which is three cube sets all together. Um, and it's going to be going and using the sun's sun, uh, energy to sell and to stabilize itself and as a propulsion method. And um, as you can also see, it said it was citizen funded. And that's what the Planetary Society is all about. Um, the Planetary Society takes uh, members like donations, and for the light cell spacecraft, uh, we, uh, there was a Kickstarter. Uh, many, uh, around 23,000 people, uh, more than 23,000, um, participated, backed the, 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 the Kickstarter campaign, and also we rounded up, uh, we rounded up over $1.224 million in funds for our next mission. Our first mission, the Light Sail 1, was just a, set, a, a, a low orbit test mission. But now let's go way back, as back as we can tell, Halley's Comet. And I'm talking about 1600s. Edmund Halley, he did not discover Halley's Comet. What he did discover, it was its orbit around the, the sun and how much time it will take Halley's Comet to come around and see it in, our na in, uh, in the night sky. So he, can, he, he discovered all this, but thanks, and also thanks to him, we know many of our, today, our navigational courses, and we can look at the star and say, this is, this is it, this is what we have, and this is what we can go to. So, Halley wrote about Halley's Comet. Meanwhile, in 1608, in the, also in the 1600s, we had Johannes Kepler. And this is a, a little quote from a letter he wrote to Galileo Galilei, saying, provide ships or cells adapted to the heavenly breezes, and there will be some who will brave even that void. And for me, this is magical words. 
because 1608, we were already thinking about putting a ship in the sky. And we're talking about, he, he doesn't even, at this time we don't know about photons. We do not know about all the things that we know about today. And he already was adapting a ship to go and sail the heavenly breezes, what he calls the heavenly breezes. And academically, his, this concept was a no-go. At that time, he didn't have the math, he didn't have the tools to push this idea onwards uh, academically. But along came Maxwell, who Maxwell, uh, uh, from Maxwell's, who did Maxwell's equations, he came, he came up with the, he discovered that light uh, traveled through packets. And that's when, where we came up with the idea, okay, so light is not simply a, a wave, it's packets, packets, what we today call photons. And thanks to Maxwell's math, we start seeing what uh, Kepler was ca calling heavenly breezes. So let's jump a little bit forward. And now we're going to the Russians. The Russians just before in, 20, in 1924, when um, the Russians started making a lot of engineering, started playing with rockets, started playing with planes, and along came, um, along came the World War II, where we started developing these rockets, we started developing these planes, we started developing ideas. <laughs> and during this time, uh, and I'm talking about 1951, 1950s now, uh, in this magazine, 1951 magazine, Astounding Science Fiction, a gentleman by the name of Carl Willy came up with the idea of taking, he was an electrical engineer, and he came with the, he came with the idea of attach, getting a uh, uh, parachute-like uh, spacecraft into, the, into space being pushed by the heavenly breezes. And he didn't only think about a parachute, he thought about uh, tethering as an actual spaceship or spacecraft to this, uh, to this um, parachute. This is actually a photo of the, the cover of that magazine, and this is actually one of the pages of, of, of that uh, article. The thing is that it's so mad, for me it's very magical, I read it, uh, and it's on, on the internet uh, PDF, if you want it I can give it to you. I, I'm sorry, no, copyright. Um, but the thing is that it's very magical because he doesn't only use his words, he uses math, he, he goes into the engineering of this parachute and how it's going to work. He enters into Ma Maxwell, he enters into Kepler. Okay? Then, around the 1960s, we start, uh, well, in the 1960s, we saw that the, the NASA, NASA was born. And at this time, we saw Sputnik, and we started playing. Now we're not playing only with rockets. Now we're playing with, let's see what's out there. Let's see planetary exploration. And with planetary exploration, this is where Halley's Comet come in. Because around this time, uh, a little bit earlier, uh, uh, Jerome Wright, uh, he, was, uh, he wrote that, what if we could rendezvous with Halley's Comet. Not using rockets, not using planes, but rather rendezvousing through solar sailing. And at this time, uh, we still, uh, NASA started also playing with solar, sa solar sailing. They started testing all these designs. And the, actually, Mariner 4 and Mariner 10, in this time, had some type, it, they weren't actually sails, they were actually like panels. They used to stabilize them, stabilize uh, the, the satellites while they were flying by Mars and, and going out into space. And actually, I think it was Mariner 4 or Mariner 10 that there was a uh, low in energy and there were a little bit of malfunctions with the, with the satellite, and they actually used those panels and 
stabilize them using the, the sun's beams. And at this time, uh, our co-founder, the co-founder of the Planetary Society, Louis Friedman, was working on JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And at this time, he was working with Mariner, he was working with all these probes. And this is uh, a little quote from his, uh, well, uh, conversation he post, uh, he put in his book, Star Saving, Solar Cells and Interstellar, Interstellar Travel, where it's a conversation between an engineer and him. And he goes, asking the, talking with the engineer, you mean flyby, no rendezvous. He's talking about Halley's Comet, rather than flying by rendezvousing with Halley's Comet. And the engineer answers, no, I mean rendezvous. And uh, Louis Friedman uh, answers with a trade time of 10 years. And he goes, would you believe four years? And that's the beauty of solar sailing. Because rather than like rocket uh, or chemical fuel, it's, it's not about acceleration. It's not a big burst of acceleration. It's a slow dynamic and momentum. It builds up speed with time. But it's so constant because photons, they just go across space and hit those solar cells and they just keep going constantly. And that's the beauty about solar city, that you don't only have, you don't have a force, but you have momentum. You have that slow acceleration. And that's why you can see, rather than 10 years, why not four? So after that, NASA got it more into solar city, but there was a big problem. Budgets. Big budgets were being cut off entirely. And I'm talking about Reagan's administration, because we also were starting to play with the shuttle missions and the shuttle program. And this was gobbling up the complete budget. And by this time, NASA had two solar sailing designs. It had the heliogyro and another design, just like light sail, uh, a butter ring style uh, uh, solar sail. Louis Friedman, by this time, he was working with this project. And they chose the hel heliogyro. The only problem of the heliogyro is that it worked with blade style sails. And although it worked with blade style sails, they had to be four miles long. So this kind of sails are so long and so big that it's going to be a payload. But at this time, somebody said, hmm, we're working with the shuttle. We can put them in the shuttle. We can use the shuttle and use astronauts to build, uh, to final the, uh, finalize the assembly up in already in, the or in orbit. But still, shuttle, uh, the shuttle was uh, greatly gobbling up all this budget. And also, we were seeing a lot of uh, delays. The shuttle was being delayed. And also, big, big aesthetics were, were being challenged here. Because still, you could put up all that, but astronauts will, ha will have to assemble it up in space. So there were big questions. At this point, the budget was being cut. Heliogyro and all the solar city went into the back seat of NASA's uh, mission and programs. Shuttle was being brought up. And then, 1980s, the Planetary Society is born, thanks to Louis Friedman, Carl Sagan, and Bruce Murray, who was director of the JPL while Louis Friedman was working on all these programs. Bruce Murray uh, steps down from being director of the JPL, and they found the, the Planetary Society. And this is a quote for Car from Carl Sagan in the, planetary, in the first Planetary Report in 1981, which the Planetary Report, I have the latest right here, if you want to see it. It's, it's about light cell, and the previous one, which is also about light cell. And you can say, we, we, we are really proud about it. We are really proud. And it's something that, it, like, if you did like me, we were in it every day. Every day. It was a roller coaster, seeing if data packets were coming in, seeing if, if it deployed, if what was happening, if the photos were working. And Carl Sagan, by 1981, he writes, if we are successful, at least some experts think we are likely to be, 
we may be able to accomplish not only our initial goal of demonstrating a base of popular support for planetary exploration, but also to provide some careful targeted funds for the stimulation of critical activities. Now, I think this quote not only highlights the mission of the Planetary Society, but it highlights something very essential in our everyday lives, and it's that what happens out there, what we have been, all these technologies that we are enhancing, greatly benefit us here on Earth. On Earth. And the Planetary Society also looks forward to democratizing all those processes of creating technologies and putting those technologies into the citizens of the world's hands. And just like Lightsail, that's part of it. And so, Carl Sagan, along with the, with the Planetary Society, started doing their own solar sailing program. They started doing uh, other, rather, with, uh, also with, uh, also with uh, SETI, which is uh, the extraterrestrial uh, search, um, they started doing solar sailing and started working on all the concepts that have been brought up from 1608, the 1600s. And again, this is old concepts, new technology. And here's a little piece of uh, Carl Sagan talking to Johnny Carson in the Johnny Carson show. It's, it's Bill Nye here of the Planetary Society. Back in 1976, shortly before I took his course, Professor Carl Sagan was on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson talking about solar sailing. It's extraordinary technology where a spacecraft is pushed through space by nothing but the pressure of sunlight. Check it out. Well, let's, let's talk about this. this, this well, this is a just tremendously exciting prospect called solar sailing. Solar sailing. This is a, uh, a very crude model and which travels on the radiation and particles that come out of the sun, the wind from the sun. And it works exactly as a ordinary sailboat does, so it can go out from the sun, it can tack inwards to the sun, and because it has a constant acceleration, it can get to around the inner part of the solar system a lot faster and a lot more conveniently than the usual sorts of a rocket propulsion. The whole just do Well, it takes you to where you want to go. So one mission that's being talked about is to run it with Ali's Hunt. And I wanted to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody's ever looked at a comic close up. Uh, and it lives mostly in the outer most part of the solar system. In fact, most of it lives between the stars. Also, this thing itself is uh, I think tremendously exciting because I kind of imagine some big device emblem, uh, not on this side but on on the other side. I don't know what the symbol would be. Uh, Over twenty million, sir. <laughs> But on the other hand, it's just an extraordinary idea, and there might be a time when we start doing interplanetary regardless. So it's a whole new kind of idea. Well, a few years later, Professor Sagan started the Planetary Society. I joined and I've been a member ever since. Johnny Carson is on our board of advisors. And now, almost 30 years later, I'm proud to say we're about to realize Professor Sagan's vision. We have built... Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Bill and I. Uh, uh. So, um, as you can see, at, this, uh, at that time, 1976, we were listening to Carl Sagan, and he, don't only, he didn't only talk about light cell and about uh, what would later become light cell, and solar sailing, but he also talked about going to a comet. And I don't know if you've been up to date, but we already are visiting a comet. Pile is in 67P, I'm not going to say the name. It's pretty difficult by itself. And, um, and also, he's talking about solar sailing. And this is right before, the four years before the Planetary Society was founded. So, and he started talking about the Planetary Society, uh, something that was still an idea. And at this point, you can see that it's the beginning. And 40 years later, uh, or 30-somethings, 30, 30 we 
we, we have launched uh, a light cell. We have launched light cell one, and it was a great success, as you will see. But first, there was a learning curve. There was there was Cosmos one. So by 1998-99, the Russians said, "Hey guys, uh, Planetary Society, I have a submarine from the Cold War, which we're retrofitting to just launch things into." a low orbit. Uh, you want to join us and uh, we'll give you a free ride for your Cosmos project, for your solar sail. Here's a photo about the Cosmos 1, which was the first of, uh, of the, the solar cell uh, concepts. And um, as you can see, it was barely bigger than what we have seen light cell is. At this time, there were no cube sets, there was no smaller satellites. We're seeing here. Uh, that's Louis Friedman uh, checking it, and this is the only picture there is of Cosmos One launch. And this is because Cosmos One, after the summer, everything was set up, and it's called Cosmos One. And I'm sorry to, to jump into this, because by 1992, Carl Sagan tragically died, and and in a in a tribute to his show Cosmos and the book, uh, they called it Cosmos One. Sadly, Cosmos 1, um, during launch, uh, the launch after 82 seconds of, of liftoff, it, it malfunctioned, it fell back into the Siberian uh, Sea, I think it was, uh, into the sea, and it was completely destroyed, no remnants were, were recovered, and this is the only photo they, there is about the launch. Um, at this point, the Planetary Society decided to, to uh, the Planetary Society decided to keep the concept alive, but funds were short, there was other programs to, to give love to, so the Planetary Society uh, persistently started looking for more ideas. And we're talking here about 1999-2001. By 2001, NASA tells the Planetary Society, hey guys, I have an ultrasat, a CubeSat, a new kind of technology, I have one free right here, I can give it to you. But later, the Department of Defense told them I, I wanted to, so they kind of said, like, okay, we're going to give it to, to, to the Department of Defense. And the, this, um, the actual uh, CubeSat that I'm talking about, that NASA had, is what we call the NanoCell D, which is right here. That's an open nano cell D. It's a little bit smaller than the light cell, the actual light cell, and it's a, a deployed uh, uh, cells. And it was very unique in, in its own way because it's low cost. CubeSats are low cost technology. Ultrasats, as, as opposed to CubeSats, is three CubeSats basically, or more. In, in this case, it's going to be three. Uh, so NanoCell, after NASA told the, uh, told the Planetary Society, guys, I'm going to give it to the Department of State, um, Department of uh, Defense, they, the, Depart uh, the Planetary Society said, OK, but we've got the concept, CubeSats. And they started scrambling for those CubeSats. At that time, there, were, uh, there was a company, uh, Stellar Explorations, who started experimenting with all this CubeSats uh, cube and all this technology, which is who ultimately has helped us launch the light cell. And also who has done all this tremendous work, and I believe it's one of the, the things that I love about it, is that it's so much, so small, but so complex in itself. And um, I'd like to... Uh, here you have an image of what the, the early concept of the light cell was, uh, as compared to a loaf of bread. I brought one. No, I don't. I'm not with a loaf of bread everywhere in New York, going like this is light cell, guys. Uh, but it looks like light cell. Uh, no endorsements. There we go. And I like I like to 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 use it as an image because you see it, but you don't imagine the size. You don't get to it's very rarely that you go to a satellite and touch and see the satellite. Or they show you, like Voyager, there's a few replicas around, you know, plastic or metal replicas, and you get to see it uh, in, in its all glory. But 
Light cell, it's so beautiful that you can take a loaf of bread from the supermarket and go, I got light cell in my hands. <laughs> and if you want to touch it, it's not the same texture in our, in our consistency, but it's close enough. So, and that's the beauty about light cell. It's small, complex, and very unique for, for me. And, and it fills me with, with a lot of joy because it's so cool. <laughs> so, by 2001, we're starting with these concepts. 2005 comes in. And we already have the concept. We put it aside for a while because, again, funding and the Planetary Society, as opposed to many organizations, is citizen funded it's by its members and also sponsors. But not all the time we've got people or, or, or companies saying, oh, yeah, guys, I'm going to give you a million dollars to do this. The Lightsell project has been citizen funded. It has been pushed by its own people, by, by People like you, me, I'm a member of the Planetary Society myself, and I'm really proud about all the projects. Also, there's also Planetary Defense Projects, if you are into that. Um, and this is, uh, right now, this is their star one, because we launched something into space, and it really works. And just to continue, here's a photo of Louis Friedman and Bill Knight, the CEO, our current CEO, Checking the Mylar sales of Lightsail, of what it will later become Lightsail. Here's Bill Nye with, with the Lightsail in his hand. It has the, the, the solar panels deployed, and this is one of the cameras. And um, at this point, um, by 2005, we're starting to, to put a launch date. We, we're starting to, to think when we can launch this, how we can work this out. Uh, we had a, a, an opportunity with NASA, which, again, it didn't happen. And by this time, we're seeing a lot of lost wind in our cells. Uh, but we're persistent. The Planetary Society uh, is really persistent in achieving its goals of extending our knowledge about space exploration. And so, Nexel got a huge piggyback in the Atlas V rocket, and, and we had a launch stage. We, which was 2005, and I'm talking 10 years after. Uh, this is 2005, 2008, so we are talking about a few years come. We already had the concept, we had the, what we wanted in the light cell, but we didn't have the technology yet uh, retrofitted into them. So we started working on putting all that technology up to date, adding the cameras, adding all the systems, and starting, and starting to do the, all the tests, deployment tests, all kinds of tests. We saw a little bit of glitches. We saw all types of uh, engineering problems. We even saw communications problems in the, uh, during the day, uh, day, uh, life of the test, which they tested like it was one day in the life of the, uh, the light cell. And it had a huge glitch. They worked with that. And by 2015, we had liftoff. Um, many of you might have seen it. I, I still love seeing it. I love lunches. So. was also carrying the mysterious Department of Defense rocket thing. We don't know what it's doing. It might be an alien. I don't know. I don't know. So at this point, uh, we were all hyped up. That day, uh, Bill Nye and uh, almost the, com the complete team was in the, and staff were in Florida watching the lift up, which was great. It went better than expected. And at that time, systems were nominal. We started seeing good systems, but suddenly Lightsail went completely silent. It, for eight days, it didn't give us any packets. It didn't give us anything. We believed that it was a battery, uh, a glitch in the battery. And this is uh, during the, the whole mission. Uh, we in cell.planetary.org uh, cell slash mission control, 
But you can see where Alexa was uh, was in. And we even had members take photos with their telescopes, with their with their with their cameras of the of the light sail going by. At first, you couldn't see anything when it wasn't deployed, since it was not reflecting any light. But after it was deployed, it was beautiful. So eight days without any communications, it wakes back up. So we're awesome. We're back up. Let's keep going. Let's keep let's keep writing. So let's keep testing. And then we took our first pi picture. Where's the picture? OK, there we go. Still not deployed. This is the picture of the inside. They uh, just tested the camera. The This is the loaf of bread still flying around, still like this. So we're seeing that, and we're saying, awesome. So everything looks good. Data was phenomenal still. A telemetry was coming out, and everything was looking good. But then we saw, and, and then we were getting ready to deploy, when suddenly it went silent again. So this is a roller coaster by this time. We're just saying, OK, we cannot deploy. And at this point, uh, the thing about LightCell 1 is that it's, uh, it, was, it had orbit decay. It, it wasn't high enough. It wasn't high enough to, to solar cell by itself. We were just testing it. We were just wanting to see how the system will, will, will work in actual microgravity, well, or no gravity, almost. So, um, so at this point, it went silent again, but it came back up. And after that, we started seeing, again, data. We started sending the commands to start deploying. This, I'm talking about waking up like a Monday or a Tuesday. Wednesday, we started working with deployment. For Friday, have actually the deployment. And this is the, the first pictures that came in from deployment. These are various pictures, with the first one being with scramble. But by the end, we had a beautiful fisheye view of, of the cell deployed. And in this picture, you can no notice it uh, because it's not uh, static. But as you can see, the cells are not fully. It, you can still see a little bit of wobbly in the cells. Actually, the cells came out up to. We're counting up to 85 to 90 percent deployment, which is great by all standards. And these cells are made to to. I don't want to say it fits themselves it, for space debris, but it's very, very unique because it's even if space debris goes through it, it still they will work. They will still be reflecting light. They will still still work. Sadly, we the light cell had two cameras, only one worked. Part of the of the testing, we're gonna work on that in the next one, and with the 1.24 billion million dollars, I hope. <laughs> billions I wish. Um, we hope that that next launch in 2016 is successful, and we see even Earth. I, I just want to see where it's from the light cell. And, and and it's beautiful. It's it's a work of art when you come to sum up all this. And although we're not gonna rendezvous with Halley's comet, we're ready to to sail outside uh, of low Earth orbit. We're ready to sell, keep going. For 2016, the plan is to go into a higher orbit and actually solar cell. Actually put the, the cells into work, stabilizing the CubeSats, stabilizing the whole process. I haven't talked about this, but actually I talked about three being three, three CubeSats in one, that loaf of bread. Two of them is for cell storage. And one of them is actually the software, the, the hardware, the, the whole brains of the, of the system. And that's the beauty of it. Low cost, uh, minor sales, and the, the highest cost, I believe, it will be the launch. And for 2016, we're going in a Falcon 9 heavy. So it's going to be awesome. Um, and with it, after. 21, 25 days of orbit. By June 8 to June 11, we received the last packets. Then it went silent, and it burned in our atmosphere in re-entry. 
But I like this quote from Bill Nye, which says, Deep breath. No turning back now. This may be a song its own. Here we go. Because it's for me, it's not only a good motto for, for the Planetary Society, it's for Lightsail. Lightsail has been an ups and downs since its conception for the Planetary Society. And also in history, we have seen how it has been challenged by the idea of the sun, by the idea of the sunlight. How are we going to put solar cells in space? Four miles of solar cells, that's impossible to get it up there. But we have done it. And we didn't put four miles of solar cells. We put a boxing ring size uh, square in a, that fitted in a loaf of bread. So that's the amazing part for me uh, about light cell. And we're capable. We're capable. And although we were not the first solar cells in space, uh, Japan beat us with Icarus, sadly. But again, this is citizen funded. This is you, this is me, this is all of us. This is the way, uh, and I believe, the future of space, uh, space flight. The future of space flight is not in the hands of the government entirely. It's also in the hands of the citizens of the world who are science literate and care about knowing more of what's out there and care know, uh, to know more about the place, our place in space. And this is a, a, a nice video when we hit the million point two, one million point two four uh, million dollars in Kickstarter, and it's a, I believe it, uh, the way Bill Nye expresses himself in this video, it's very how every member when we saw that Kickstarter go up, when we saw that light cell go up uh, and deploy, I think it's a, it's the way we all felt, and you can hear a crack in his voice because he's excited, and and I think it. it as a CEO, Phil like can, cannot be better. And he's a New Yorker now, so <laughs> you might see him around 24th Street. I don't know. Oh. I've been watching this. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are very close. We just made it. We made it to our goal of $1,240,000 for our light sail spacecraft flight next year in 2016. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much for your support. I'm Bill Nye, CEO of the Planetary Society. We are going to have a successful flight thanks to you. We're going to go to a higher orbit. We're going to demonstrate solar sailing. For real. We're going to be on a bigger rocket. It's going to be a very exciting flight. And we're advancing space science and exploration uh, with this new uh, use of this very old idea. This is a new technology, solar sailing. It goes back to my old professor, Carl Sagan. And, uh, well, it's, it's really moving. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Let's change the world. And I think he's as excited as I am about this 2016. And uh, I hope I could be there in the, during the launch. Uh, and just going to scream like a, like a bald guy, just go, ah, and seeing that such a launch. Because for me, this is it. This is part of what spaceflight is all about. And 23 thousand backers in Kickstarter and we're looking up forward to not only getting that light cell up in the air again, up in orbit, uh, and <laughs> solar cell actually, uh, we're looking at using solar cells to, to deploy into the Lagrange points and work as a sat actual satellite. We're looking forward to even getting into other, other planets. Uh, there's also plants from Japan, I believe, and I think uh, the European Space Agency to get a solar cell to the moon. So that cell not only was for us proof that it can be done, but it's also been the inspiration for other companies, other other countries to say, this is it. This is also a propulsion. Right now, chemical propulsion is expensive. It's it's heavy. And this is this is another way of looking at it. And do you have any questions? Uh, Forgive me, this is all totally new to me, so it, it seems like a funny question. Um, there are no funny questions. Okay, well, it, it's kind of asking the question of like how many clowns we are. I just my the mind is boggled. Uh, again, my mind is boggled by when you say. 
course, four miles of material that's oh, oh, so. Okay, so, so that's the thing. It is possible, but it's a huge payload. Um, if we go back in, not only in the presentation, but in time. Um, I mean, like, more, more simply, like, it just, how do you physically fit four square miles of material? Actually, I, oh, no, yes, yes, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm going to explain. So, it's not four square, it's four, not four square miles. It's not four miles. In the, in the, in the, actually, light cell is only the, the cells are the size of a bottom. The four miles was a previous idea, a previous concept of a solar cell by NASA during the 1960s and 1950s. Uh, 1960s, 1970s. And it was to get to Halley's Comet, to rendezvous with Halley's Comet. Actually, light cell only has a, around a bottom ring of, of the cell, which um, I have a video, I just don't have it in the, in the in the presentation, but I can put it on, of the raw, how it expanded. Because during testing, they, they did an actual deployment in Caltech's uh, storage facilities. And it's beautiful. It's like 3.45 min uh, minutes. And it's, it's very interesting. It's not four miles. And yes, uh, about the four miles of, of them, it was the concept of the heliogyro in by NASA. And we will never know how that fits into a shuttle or into anything at all because it was scrapped. It was scrapped and it's too huge to and in in a time where to get something into orbit is so expensive by just a few you know a few kilograms it's so it's around uh, ten thousand it, dollars. It 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 will be expensive to get that concept that they were working on the 1960s into space. So the answer to that problem is CubeSats. The answer to that problem was that loaf of bread and a boxing size, a boxing sized uh, cells. Andre, your question though was is that maybe she does you should explain that it's 18 feet by 18 feet. Yes. So it would fit inside this room quite easily. Actually, yes. So that's that was the size of light cells that they fit in this space. And if I put it in the middle, if I if I had the low, uh, light cell with me and I put it in the, in the in the middle of this room and I deploy it, it will fit easily, and it will open up. And I want to now. I'm really excited to put you that that video because it's so cool. And, and there's no music, so it's kind of boring in that sense, but it's super cool. Oh, sorry. Uh, he was first. And this is actually working on radiation pressure. Uh, yes. There's a uh, device called a radiator, and uh, the two, uh, it's an old uh, science device, and basically it's inside this hole, and it rotates with uh, these uh, two metal uh, uh, pieces of uh, material, and uh, as the sun hits it, it moves. But it's uh, it works on uh, radiation pressure. Oh yeah, and the principle is that one. Yeah. It's actually the pressure. Yeah, it's radiation. So, and, and one of the questions uh, I've been bringing up in almost all the lectures that Planetary Society has been giving is that what do we do at the moment that we exit the, 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 the area of the uh, solar system? How do we work that? I had another question too. Did you put any? Uh, were there any gyros or anything inside? Small brand. Gyros, yes. Uh, well, not not gyros. There were sensors, but uh, I believe that not actually gyros. Yeah. I, I, about the specs of, of the spacecraft and the yeah. engineering of the spacecraft, which I didn't enter actually into in this presentation. I, um, since I'm not actually an engineer. Uh, I'm going to be trying to get a, an actual uh, somebody from the team or somebody that can explain that area. And all those engineers and scientists like me that are really happy about knowing that information, I will try to schedule a nice lecture about it and it will come up and uh, I promise you uh, I will do my best. Because I didn't want to enter into that because I didn't want to really tell the wrong stuff about the specs of the space I'm sitting down 
by accident, they actually had a driver up there from the tip of the rocket. And they were calculating where they know would go like uh, an extra five miles, but they didn't realize it was like 80 miles. That's the recession, the recession of the actual field of that the uh, momentum of the driver actually sent it actually further away, which was it. <coughs> and if you actually put that in, I bet it would actually work quite well. That's that's nothing new. Gyros is oh, no, no, no. been around for years. Yeah. yeah. And gyros actually, um, I think I did here. But I'll enter into Jairus the next time. <laughs> um, oh, wait, uh, 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 this gentleman. Well, Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I got a ton of questions, but um, you don't have a sample of uh, my one. So for those who back the, the, <laughs> the, the Kickstarter, around $30 to $60, they will get a centimeter or a miler. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, but uh, I don't have it with me. Uh, I don't have a sample of the either. But I, I'll, I'll for next time I'll have it hopefully, and I'll be like. Sh my my question is that Carl Sagan said back in '76 that he said he'd be able to tack back to the sun, and I don't see how that's possible. Now, mind you, I'm relating to a ship that has a sail, but you also have. You need two mediums. You need the water and the air. The air provides the power and the, and the water, water provides will that give you the direction. ability yeah. to go back into the wind, but there's no second medium uh, it, with the sun, so I don't see how you could possibly you might be able to cut across and you can't touch that. The, the second part mm -hmm. comes from the from the, the, yeah. from the force. In other words, if there's two forces involved, there's a light yes. cell force and one force. And there's a force of gravity on the sun uh, affecting the spacecraft. If you slow down the spacecraft, it will fall into the sun. Yeah. And the fall, the slowing down the spacecraft is provided by the sun. Like <laughs> well, okay, that's fine, but my understanding is that the white sail is really good because it builds momentum constantly. Yeah. It's very fast, and, and that doesn't matter and, and, and actually slow down to go back to gravity. And, and that's true. And that's the thing about light sail. And for me, it's a little bit of a con because we're not thinking about returning. All, right now, the idea of, of solar sailing is upwards. All the time, we're thinking about upwards right now. And it's one of the, those things that uh, it's also in development. This one came back because. Do you have targets at this time for those? Well, um, there's actually uh, right now uh, light sail B. It's planned to be, I think, in that's the one in the branch points. One of uh, one of the plants is the branch points. Okay. It, one of them is gonna uh, in the future is gonna get to the Lagrange point and it's gonna be working uh, monitoring the sun. Another one is gonna be between the moon and the uh, and, and Earth. And hopefully, one of the things that Bill Nye has been mentioning a lot is putting a laser-like uh, uh, system in the moon and using that laser for those distances where the, the, the radiation the, the radiation pressure is not that high and keep pushing that light cell or that solar cell. Keep going. It sounds incredibly and, and, and Bill Nye, and, and these are not actually my words, and, and it sounds a little bit science fiction but it's not actually a, a laser. It's that that's my way of saying layman's terms. Uh, but it's not. The point is that there's, it, there's going to be a system in the moon or around the moon that it's going to be uh, introducing energy that will help light cell in those areas where the sun is not that effective anymore. Does anybody know this Icarus or Matrix? They don't wait to do the same thing. Yeah. They do a flat line. Okay. Yes. They use that sun jamming thing that this gentleman was talking about in terms of um, solving its velocity and gravity going towards the sun because after all, Venus is closer to the sun. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, sir. So, I understand the physics, and I understand uh, that you. Demonstrated that you can get some kind of joy. Are, are there 
particular mission studies in the sense of, okay, you get a uh, Delta 9 mission. So you're going to get to a higher orbit. So what? Right now, uh, you know, what, are, what are you going to do? So for 2016, as opposed to this one, this one was just testing the, the, the actual light cell and testing all systems and how it works because, again, we, we still are, are new testing all these systems, all these uh, ideas, concepts. Um, for 2016, up to now, it's actually using solar cell, but we're not going to do something just yet. We're still, now we're going to see how solar cell really works. How is it to maneuver the, the, the spacecraft? How to tack into the sun, uh, towards the sun? Which again, it, 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 it sounds really counterintuitive, but he's correct. It's through flowing down the, the spacecraft and using gravity. Right. The, same way, the same way we can rendezvous with planets. We, we, turn, we thrust and we turn the, the spacecraft in a way that we slow it down and we start flying by or getting closer to the planet and use its momentum, uh, gravitational momentum, to, to fly by or rendezvous with the planet. Going to be the same size as these ones? Um, for Light Cell uh, 2, Light Cell 2, it's going to be, uh, I believe the cell was going to be a little bit bigger. Spacecraft power is going to help any? Yeah, the, it's going to be a ultra set, three cube sets. Uh, it's mainly going to be the same. Uh, that one's going to fly far away? This one, uh, yes, we hope uh, it's not as interplanetary, but we wanted to actually use solar sailing to, to go around the Earth and orbit the, the Earth. And, and we want to know how to play <clears throat> the directions. It's like playing with a, with a plane for the first time. Hopefully it's not really flying because it will crash. Oh. So uh, what is the actual material that extends? Because I know you said uh, space debris doesn't stop it. So what is the oh, material? So, um, so the, the actual material of the cells is mylar. And but it has a it's woven and it has a technology and I forgot the name right now, Bill Nye knows it very well. Which when debris can puncture it, because it's a, it's something that we gotta see very a uh, reality today. Rock space rocks, uh, even debris from human uh, space flight can can puncture the, the mylar. So it has a system where, where it still will be, uh, it won't affect uh, the integrity of the rest of the mind. It's going to, even in a sense, it's going to keep it uh, close together. Unlike real cells, that if you puncture it, it might even wobble a little bit and you lost the cell completely. Oh, sorry, the hazel was that's that's the, that the, the the whole point of the Kickstarter. It's uh, I, I don't have the chart here, but the Kickstarter. Our goal was twenty uh, two hundred thousand only. That was our goal, and with that we will only just uh, cover some of the costs. The rest will have been uh, sponsors and and member. Uh, Quotes, but uh, at this point, uh, with that 1.2 million dollars, uh, we will be not only costing for the 2016, but also education, outreach events, and it, it it goes far beyond the actual building and launching of the light cell. What about uh, like the SpaceX? SpaceX is what launched. Yeah, Falcon 9. Okay, yes. so uh, what was the cost for them? Uh, that information, I owe it to you. Uh, that information I don't have it right now, but I, I can answer it later on. Okay. Cost is free. You this one is free. Launch cost. The second launch cost, the second will be on the Falcon Heavy, yeah. in, uh, in that nominally in April 2016, and it's free. That so one's free, right? Yeah, there's no way. You couldn't, you couldn't afford yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, um, actually, um, with NASA, it was going to be 1.8 for the Cosmos million, 1.8 million. So it was it was going to be really cost. I was just well, I, I was just wondering. I don't know if that was a real answer to this, but 
if you do the light sail and you go out and build momentum to Mars, Jupiter, and Mars, is there a point where the sun's uh, pressure is sort of a law of diminishing returns where it doesn't? Yeah, work? and that's where the, the moon laser idea comes in. <laughs> Oh, and that's but, just an idea, a concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when would you start shooting it? With you? Do, do you shoot it? The, idea, the main idea is not also, it's not so much a moon laser as it is a sun type of device that will continue providing that energy that the sun cannot provide anymore in the outer solar, solar system. Or even with, out but, of the solar system. I forget about that, just with the sun itself, the physical cross of the order of the doesn't <clears throat> get enough. Uh, Pressure to do momentum, or, or is, it, is it supplied all the way through? The well, one of the things is that, first of all, in space there's no friction. So once you build momentum, it's going to continue on. Uh, not only that, but uh, photons, it's content, constant momentum. It's going to keep hitting that cell constantly. Like when we go out during a sunny day, we feel that heat. It, uh, but that light, it's constantly hitting us, constantly without stopping, and that's, uh, and, and that's how it works. When it starts diminishing, it's not going to slow down because there's no friction, but it's not going to continue accelerating. There's not going to be an uh, efficient way to direct the, the yeah, spacecraft. Kind of like so, so that's where the lasers and the idea of providing extra push with other machinery, uh, maybe a station with some kind of uh, emitting some kind of energy, that will continue pushing that uh, spacecraft, or at least stabilizing it towards its goal. Any other questions? Does your engineering team come from actually the study, or do you have? So uh, the engin engineering team comes from various places. Mainly, it comes from Caltech and other universities. Uh, we do have engineers in our advisory uh, board and in our uh, board of directors, including Neil. You know the grass size, and he's not an engineer, but you know. Um, and most uh, most of them, I believe, they're from Caltech in California. So the same people are going to work on the next one. Yeah, for now they're going to be working on that. And also, uh, cube sets and all that are provided and are uh, manufactured by Stellar Exploration, which is another company uh, that is helping us greatly with this cube sets. Yeah, I realize that this is a little bit different because it's CubeSat based, but um, to what extent are your engineers looking at what the Japanese have accomplished by Icarus in terms of developing control systems and protocols, etc.? Right now we're sticking up with, with CubeSats. Mm -hmm. That's as far as we have gone right now with that concept. Uh, right now, uh, at least, uh, uh, there, we, I haven't heard any talks about going any bigger because uh, one of the questions uh, that was were received, and I love that answer. Is that when can we put like a spacecraft to get humans out of Earth using solar cells? And that's where the four miles of cell would come in, because you will need as much energy as you can to just put uh, to just tether that spaceship out with so much, so much uh, weight, <laughs> and 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 you will need more more uh, area to cover. So that's where the payload, that's where uh, bigger uh, systems, you will, you, you will need bigger systems. This system right now is basing itself just to gather data, look at things, take pictures. It's like a selfie for, for space. Okay, I know you have plans for 2016, and that's like the main goal and what you're working towards. Are there any further plans if that is successful yes. after 2016? Yes, there are more plans, and again, it's going to be sending, uh, after 2016, the plans are going to start being gathering information, like the one for the Lagrange points and other plans to, to just go around the moon. Just keep going, pushing the boundaries. Uh, eventually, the plans are to interplanetary uh, exploration. Uh, I saw one in the back. Oh. I'm just a crew, <laughs> design, so, and ideas that right behind. Uh, so. 
So actually, the information gathered by Lightcell A and all this Lightcell, since it's citizen content, Lightcell is you and me. So by that, I don't mean like, oh no, you you'll get some of the information. You, this is this is technically this is ours, and you will be able to to look at the engineer. You will be able to look at what goes around. So yes, the the, the answer in, in in a way, it's gonna be that yes, this is. Kind of like uh, resource uh, outsource, uh, outsource. Um, what? Open yes, open source. There we go. Sorry. So, but he was asking. Uh, you mentioned we spoke about the data. Uh, he was talking about this actual design. The like. Yeah. Oh, So right now they're talking about it. Yes, they're talking about giving out more information about the actual engineering that the the actual <laughs> design of the of the light cell, and. Uh, this design, uh, as we can see, it's not that new. So, so NASA had it with NanoCell D. This is just a, for me, it's a better design uh, because it has a lot of improvements to it. But again, it's going to be basically open source. Uh, to what extent, I really don't have that that, that information. Uh, so, if you went to the four mile Silver sale. Uh, what would be the mass on that? That's a good question. I'm not an astrophysicist, and I, I really don't have an idea, a clear idea of what the mass will be uh, within four miles. But the the basic idea is that it will it will carry a, around a bigger satellite than, than this one, or tether a bigger uh, a spacecraft than, than a CubeSat. But the idea is that the bigger the, 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 the mass, the more energy you will need. And the more energy means you will need bigger cells. Is there a ratio of mass to the area? Yes. yes. There is. So what's the size of the CubeSat? The CubeSat is 30 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So it's a 3D? What? It's a 3D CubeSat? Yes. For, for the library? For the... Uh, yes, it's going to be the, the, the same size. The same size. The what's going to vary, I believe, it's the cell. The cell is going to be a little bit. Uh, for those people that did, that missed the Kickstarter and want to keep up with oh, the yes. cell, is there any way number one that they can donate, and then number two, uh, they can get regular blog entries or something? What's going on? Okay, so this is more of uh, Planetary Society New York City information, and also Planetary Society. So you, if you want to keep going with this, the Kickstarter campaign is already closed. And apparently, there's going to be more Kickstarter campaigns for the 2016 and the, the later missions. But if you want to keep going with other this program and other programs, and also, uh, and this is where Stand Up for Space comes in, uh, if you want to advocate for space exploration, keep uh, NASA's budget it at least stabilize it or at least make it grow a little bit. Uh, you can go to the planetary.org uh, and there you can join. As a member, I, I, you, you pay a donation, you become a member, and you're already on, on the first steps to, to just making space flight real and democratize space flight. And also advocate for better education and for better uh, better chances of being other planets. <laughs> So it's in, in the works, yes. It, there's going to be more crowdfunding. After this tech startup campaign, we're going crazy with it. And, and hopefully, we're going to see more campaigns. We're going to see more projects. Right now, the, the Planetary Society physically has moved to a new office area. So And it's beautiful. I saw a few pictures. And it's awesome. And you can buy a break from that new uh, office and with your name. Uh, or anything you like to write on that brick for a few bucks and uh, even have it in the more you pay, a little bit more size and a little bit more information in that brick. Where's the office? Uh, the office, well, uh, it was in Pasadena. I believe it stayed in Pasadena. I don't remember right now the, the address. Uh, but yeah, it's... You, you said you had a New York office. We do not have a New York office. No. Uh, the office is right here. Wouldn't it be more would you like to get? What would be more? Oh, I would love to. I, I would be a crazy guy. Yes? 
Wouldn't it be more appropriate if the final table is a felony that caucuses are not? That's what, that's the real that's plan. That's the goal. <laughs> yeah, like, let's get started, open an office, and, I don't know, and settle this. It's going to take a while. How many photos does it take for getting or kiss? Um, and has it, you know, you mentioned uh, space shock before. Has it ever come across as photos of the Um, you mean for light cell? Yeah. So for light cell, we didn't see any of that action because it was so low, uh, it was really low in the orbit. It was decaying really fast. And it just was 21 days. 21 days is really long time. It could be <coughs> fairly easily with all the debris in space. But um, we didn't see it. We couldn't take much photos. The only photos we have is the one from the inside of the light cell. The one, and we had that one that with the, the, the cells deployed. And, and we were going to have another camera, but it malfunctioned. It, it had a glitch. So that's why we also shortened pictures. And also, uh, basically, uh, the packets were coming like in, in a basically in the same speed as a 56k uh, connection. So it was pretty slow in a sense. One of your stretch goals uh, when you reach the 1.2 million on Kickstarter was to have a third ground station. Yes. Do you know where that's going to be? I not, uh, that information has not come up yet. So. So do you have uh, data from light cell one as to how much uh, delta D or energy is actually So all, all that data that was collected during light cells one uh, problem uh, story is an adventure. It's still they're they're still gathering it and providing, it. and it's going to be provided to everybody. Right now, I cannot tell you where, where it's going to be and how they're going to provide it, but it's going to be available. And, do, and during the whole flight, we had people from around the world tapping into information from, from various sources, looking at the telemetry and helping Jason Davis, who was in the mission control in the control room, uh, seeing all, everything uh, in act time, uh, real time. My question isn't very different. Going into the actual mathematics of it, is the velocity constant, or are you creating some sort of mechanism to like create more velocity? But I'm sure, like, since the speed of light is constant, I don't know how. <laughs> so, as opposed to rocket uh, uh, chemical fuel and chemical rocket fuel, uh, there's no burst of acceleration. Um, here we're going to play a little bit with the physics of, of moving in the direction that the, light set, the cells are hitting uh, as opposed to the sun. Uh, depending on where the sun is and how the, the, the actual cells are pointing to, you're going to have the, seat, the speed. And it's, there's no real acceleration, you know, 0 to 100 in one second. What you're going to be seeing is momentum, more of a acceleration that comes from those bones. This Yes, light travels constantly, uh, travels at a constant speed, and since light uh, doesn't actually accelerate, you know, once it hits the cells, what you're going to be is a constant uh, movement, constant propulsion, rather than acceleration. That's why, that's why uh, the, I like, now I like the moon's laser idea. <laughs> um, that's why the idea is not actually to put rockets into it but rather have something pointing at it, giving it energy when it's out of the solar's uh, energy, uh, you know, the perimeter of good energy, uh, to rather than accelerate it, keep that momentum going. But it can accelerate, but still, it, 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 it depends on how you move the, the direction of the cell. Uh, along with that question, I was thinking about um, Standard thing is to go into orbit, but to break out of orbit, that's to use the sail, or is there going to be another? No, assist? that's the problem. 
that if you enter into orbit into a, 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 a planet, you enter into orbit. You don't have acceleration to get out of it. So you, you're going to have to shoot another chemical rocket to no. no, that's what the drivers are coming from. Yeah. That's, that's what I was talking yes. about. Yes. They use that all the time. Wait, no, no, because uh, that, uh, the gyros. That's stability, but that's not. You got me there. No, 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 I'm going to ask. I got to ask. The full assail, accelerator, decelerate the vehicle. The only requirement to escape the Earth is to have sufficient acceleration over a yes. sufficient period of time, and you escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. So, but, that, but there's all orbits I see go dark light, dark light, and yeah, you exactly. lose the dark. But no, no, you don't accelerate the dark. Not right. That's not the way yes. it works. You continue to accelerate each time you go, but every time the sun is visible, and if it's impacting on the sail, the sail will push the spacecraft a tiny little bit, but over time. But I mean, this is we're talking months or? Yeah, about months. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if, if, if you orbit the uh, planet, you, you have to orbit it in order to see the sun again. So right. it will take the time it will orbit. That's so planet. in a few months, it'll reach the moon. How about that? Uh, <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. I think it, I it seems better to put a booster on it. Okay, yeah, it depends but, on the mission design. Yes. So you have one side coming up. The sun will be coming on one side, one side of the orbit, and it will come on the other side, the other side of the orbit. So how would you turn the, the sail um, one side of the orbit to the other? Right. And, and how much? <laughs> it, it takes a lot of energy. So you have what kind of uh, thing to turn around? Yes. Because then you'll be accelerating, 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 accelerating. Because of gravity, you. But careful, careful, you're mixing things. Yes. You just want to rotate the orientation so that the sun is always pushing you in the right direction. That's right. That's right. So, so now the question is, well, how do you turn a spacecraft in space when there's no friction? You use something called a momentum wheel. I know, but can you, uh, can that size of a jeep of, of a sail, can you do that with the CubeSat? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, the sail, is it very heavy? No, it's designed to be extremely, extremely light. So it doesn't take a lot of force or a momentum wheel of very large size to change the orientation so that you're so that the sun is always assisting you. If the sun is in a bad position and will slow you down, you put the sail so that it doesn't see the sun. So it's like right edge on the sun. I, mean, for, I, I know I know if you say so the uh, mechanical uh or mechanical, I'm impressed that you will be able to do that with the size the size uh, on the Small cube size. It's called rocket science. Yes. <laughs> and that's a beautiful thing to be done. If you want more detailed information, the Planetary Society has an excellent series of papers or, or blog yes. entries uh, describing this at planetary.org forward slash blog. So you can just look up one like momentum wheel. Uh -huh. One momentum wheel is sufficient. Okay. And, and, and if you want live answers to those questions, you can uh, tweet uh, Jason Davis and Emily that come up. And, yeah, yeah, but they, they're all the time answering questions like this, and they're super great, they're super knowledgeable about the whole orbital mechanics, all the mechanics about the light cell. It was, it was a Dr. Eric Lathwaite, uh, who died back in the 90s. He actually was uh, one of the leading world experts on the gyroscopic motion. And he would take a 200 pound weight uh, that you couldn't lift all narrowly directly with your wrist. But when you spun literally and drive to a high speed, you were able to lift it right over your head and it would actually lose weight. It wouldn't lose all the weight, but it would lose enough weight to lift it literally be able to put it over your head. So, it, it, you know, gyros are definitely uh, accessible and they, they've been used a regular number of uh, aircraft. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they use yeah. them on the ships, too. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, I sort of have a miscellaneous question. Yeah. What would happen if there was a solar flare and it was <laughs> <laughs> Solar flare? <laughs> it would work. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, so, actually, if there is a solar flare and it hits the actual light cell, that's a good scenario. <laughs> and that's a good question. I cannot answer it. Uh, in, in this case, uh, solar flare, you've got actual and more than just uh, uh, pressure, radiation pressure. Here you got even particles from the sun. So most likely, my my uh, assumption and my and this is a little bit of a speculation. Uh, it might even damage the whole system, and the miler might not uh, 
take all that burning and, and heat from, the, from that like, kind of radiation. Oh, it, it just goes, it just goes to have more power. Is it not um, No, it's reflective, but it's not conductive, actually. So I think so the question about the so like the yes. So it's not only a piece and the sale is then basically now. Um what's the point of maybe larger? Because that way because it's just you know like the sale you know, the largest sale. Well, as opposed to a, a the sale of boats. Here we have friction. We have other other variables inside the, safe, the, the, the experience of saving. In the in the in the sense of solar saving, you don't have friction. But and although uh, the the light is constant in its speed, um, the bigger the cell, the more energy is going to be reflected. The more just imagine more you can cap, uh, catch more air, more sun rays from it. And the big, the bigger the mass of that object that you want to tether or you want to be traveling with, the more energy you're going to need to move uh, around space. Okay. I mean, I, I understand that you know it's more, more about surface to reflect, but why? If it's moving, it's like what's the because the thing is that although although it's moving at the same speed, uh, in order to maintain not only acceleration but because you, uh, as opposed to rocketry, we're not seeing acceleration. We don't we don't want to go from zero to a hundred and then from a hundred to a, 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 a two thousand. We just want to see constant acceleration. We want to see constant move. And this same way. Um, in order to maintain that acceleration and in order to keep that that uh, cell and its spacecraft moving, you need more space, more energy. To, because you're not going to see it accelerate more. You just want it to maintain it in that acceleration. It, it, it might go slower. It will go slower, actually. And, and, oh, and you will not catch all that energy that you need to move a bigger mass, actually. What's the key? That information I don't have anymore. Uh, it's not moving at all. Because yes. It's not the atmosphere. Seriously. So. Okay. Oh, wait. Uh, you mean the light shell right now? What is the atmosphere supposed to move at? Yeah. 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 Ye
Um, yeah, the radiation uh, uh, shield is again the bone marrow. You know what type of this? No, I don't have information about the radiation shield. Okay, there's, uh, there's a lot of new discoveries that uh, are called carbon 60. Oh, yeah. Uh, people have talked about that. It's a healthy one. Cannabis, which is pretty interesting stuff. And uh, along with other better uh, materials used for everyone who's recovery in the process. Are you talking about radiation shielding for the avionics inside the space? Yeah, yeah, electronics. The interesting thing about that, if you don't, they take the attitude that will let the computer reset when it gets hit by a gamma ray, and it's cheaper and less expensive and a lot less weight, and you'll see a lot more performance by doing that. That means they can use a commercial processor, like a cell phone processor, not some super slow radiation hardened, super duper expensive processor. It'll just be Saturday so often. Yeah, that was referring quickly to the actual shield the entire track. Yeah, that's a we're not that's that's, that's, that's not the actual component system. Right, but it's actually the mission the mission design is instead of just trying to find you know ten million dollars to make the spacecraft, yes. we'll spend only uh, hundred thousand and then we know it will be Saturday so often. We can keep it cheap, keep it as a cost of the issue. But you already said yeah, eight days of downtime. And uh, the reason that eight days stopped is because it got hit by an MRA, yeah. causing the processor to be set. In other words, if it, if it is $10 million components, the software button that yeah. the, uh, the latch-up of the, the, the freeze of the computer well, 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 would have been Do they know that that's assuming uh, something that you know what made it fail? They have an idea. They, they stopped the yeah. they, 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 stop. they launched it with buds. Because they couldn't go back into the processor. They discovered the bugs after the, pro after the, the satellite was sealed in the NASA, uh, the, uh, the yeah. super duper, the super heavy uh, security launch. So they couldn't go back into the spacecraft and change the software. So it was launched with a known, with known bugs. And the known bug caused the software a computer freeze. Microsoft. No, no. <laughs> 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 To launch a spacecraft for literally pennies, and uh, you can do the full million dollar safety design. So, um, so they, they, they believe that there's a community for the processor that was in uh, the spacecraft, uh, a community of people that use that processor, and they to launch that processor into space. And they said, well, you know, if it freezes, just wait. And what will happen is we get zapped by a gamma ray and we'll restart, and it should cure the problem. So they waited. And they waited, and they waited, and eight days later, usually it happens on the order of like 14 every two to three weeks. They were lucky, it only took them eight days to hit a gamma ring, so. They like yeah. totally destroyed I'm sorry? That's, that's the main point. They totally destroyed it. No, the gamma rays don't destroy this. The, they, they cause a, uh, they trigger a fault because of, there, there is some parity inside the uh, yeah, It's an overbolt. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry? Overbolt. No, no, not, a, not an overbolt. It triggers a, in other words, a correctable RAM fault that causes a hardware interrupt, and the hardware interrupt is the reset of the space, right? Yeah. Which is great, cheap, and it gets the problem fixed. You just have to design your software so that it'll always restart correctly without your assistance. So the gamma ray is like a CPU reset. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. a turn on, turn off. And, and it's a random thing, so you, know, you just sort of design your system and your mission such that. You get a random reset. Was, your mission is not deployed. That's really critical for this type of space right now. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. And uh, yeah, we're probably going to do more stuff in society. Uh, Andre represents the chapter here in New York City. Uh, it's pretty active, especially in summer. Yes. <laughs> and so it's a good time to get involved with the planetary And please, join the planetary society. Uh, let us know uh, if you what kind of events. We've got a survey. Fill it out and have fun. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, yeah, yeah.